Shalom, shalom, Boker Tov. Hope everyone's having a wonderful day. Excited to learn with you the Sefer Achinuch today uh, around uh, Sfirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer. As always, if you have questions or thoughts during our learning, feel free to weigh in and comment here so that uh, we can learn together. Okay, we're going to look at two of the mitzvot, number 302 and 306. And we're jumping forward a little bit here in order that we can continue to stay with the upcoming holiday of Pesach and ultimately of Shavuot as well. And so we're in two. Is mitzvah korban ha'omer shal so'orim b'yom sheni shal Pesach. Right here we see that the mitzvah of offering of the omer of barley on the second day of Passover. And we learn this from Vayikra, from the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 9 to 11, which say, when you come to the land that I am giving you, and you reap the harvest, you shall bring the Omer of the first of your harvest to the Kohen, to the Kohen. He shall wave the Omer before God to be an appeasement for you on the day following the Sabbath, meaning the first day of Pesach, and the Kohen shall wave it. Okay, so here we see the mitzvah in 302 of this, uh, this barley offering. The Sefer Achinuch explains here that the root of the precept lies the aim that we should reflect through this act on the great kindness that the eternal Lord does with human beings. Chesed ha-gadol she'ose Hashem baruchu, the great act of kindness that God does with human beings to renew the produce of grain each year for sustenance. It is therefore fitting for us that we should offer up some, some of it to God, that we might remember God's kindness and great goodness before we enjoy any benefit from it. So today we oftentimes talk about making a bracha, making a blessing before food consumption as a way of expressing gratitude. And also the rabbis understand that in a post-temple era, um, rather than offering sacrifices, um, that we replace that with chesed, with acts of kindness. And so we can think in the spirit of the Omer offering, how we're going to do acts of chesed, acts of, of giving through food this holiday. Because if the Omer is about embracing the bounty of our harvest, the bounty of what we have, and to be sure, many of us today have far more uh, in our fridges and our cabinets and pantries than kings had throughout history access to, um, uh, that we should express our gratitude through blessings um, and also through giving back through chesed. Sefer Achinuch continues, Now we were commanded about this for the second day of Passover, not the first, so that we should not mingle one rejoicing with another. So that's very interesting, right? That this, uh, this offering happens on the second day of Pesach, not the first. And the, the, the reason the Sefer Chinuch gives here is that we don't mix one joy with another joy, a common, a common idea, um, that really we're focused on Yitziat Mitzrayim, we're focused on the freedom from slavery on Pesach, and thus we should save the Omer for day two so we don't get those, these two things mixed up. The, the, the wonderful bounty of our harvest is, is, is significant, uh, that happens in springtime, but it should be separated as a celebration to add even more joy um, after Pesach. But my teacher, Rabbi Nathan Lopez Cardozo, has another very fascinating reason why we don't bring the Omer offering till day two, or why we don't start counting the Omer until day two. And he explains that day one of Pesach is God-centric. God takes us out of Egypt. That's the theme. But by day two, it's about human responsibility. Now that we've embraced omnipotence and given up our control and submitted that we're not the ones in control of the world, now we have to uh, engage in hishtadlus, our, our striving and our human, to actualize our human potential um, in the world. And so we wait to count the Omer, we wait to bring the Omer offering until day two, because now that we've embraced divine uh, omnipotence, now we take our own initiative and we start counting and we start, um, you know, uh, embracing this bounty in our own way. Okay, so that is Mitzvah 302, which um, today is not really applicable because we don't have an, a, a temple, of course. So we don't bring this barley offering anymore. 
Um, there are some who yearn to do that again, some who don't yearn to do that again. But nonetheless, that is, uh, becomes codified uh, or becomes uh, manifest today through Sfira Ta'omer. Now, this is interesting for a number of reasons. One is because we rarely uh, are able to um, bring into the Taryag Mitzvot, into the 613, a remembrance and an embracing of something that no longer exists, right? We may, in certain prayer services, talk about sacrificings of the days of old, but uh, that's on a rabbinic level that we're really uh, embracing that. Whereas here, number 306, mitzvah 306, is mitzvat sfirata omer, the counting of the omer, which is embracing that 50-day count period between Pesach and Shavuot, between Passover and Shavuot. Now, what does sfira mean? Sfira. It comes from the word mispar, which means a number, or lisaper means to count. Or, but then it, it's even richer than that. We talk about Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim, the telling of the story of leaving Egypt. Sipur is connected to Mispar. Um, and then uh, part of it is about being uh, the, the quantitative element of telling, that we want to multiply the ways we tell. And then fascinating enough, we have in Kabbalah the Sfirot, the Sfirot, which has the same root also, which means the divine manifestations in this world. Um, and so this notion of counting is much more than just numbers. There's an element of storytelling in the counting. There's an element of divine manifestation that comes through the counting as well. So mitzvah 306, if you're learning along, again, feel free to post questions or comments as we go. Uh, we learn here from um, uh, Vayikra 23, verses 15 to 16 in Leviticus. Usfartem lechem imacharat hashabbat miyom haviachem et omer hatznufa sheva shabbatot t'mimot tiyena. That's the first verse, and then we see ad imacharat hashabbat hashviit tisparu chamishim yom v'hikravtem mincha chadasha ladonai. So you should count for yourselves from the day after Shabbat, meaning the day after Pesach, from the day that you brought the omer of the waving. Seven weeks, they shall be complete. Until the day after the seventh week, you shall count 50 days and you shall bring a mincha chadasha lashem. You shall bring a new flower offering for God. So the Sefer Chinuch highlights here, v'aleinu limnot bo hayamim yom yom v'chein hashvuot, that we count here the days and also the weeks. So we see here the mitzvah of remembering the Omer offering and remembering this journey in the Midbar, in the desert, through this counting. Sefer Achino continues, L'fi shakol ikaran shal Yisrael, enu ela haTorah, that the whole purpose of the Jewish people itself is the Torah, that we are not merely a cultural people, but rather we are a people of moral and spiritual mandate. And um, thus, we don't stop with Pesach, that the freedom itself disconnected from Matan Torah, from the embracing of our mission, is in many ways empty. And so we want to be sure to connect the two. And Sfirah to Omer is going to connect our freedom to our mission. And that's what the Sefer Chinuch highlights here. And he goes on, Vahi ha'ikar v'hasiba shenigalu v'yatsum ha'mitzrayim k'dei sh'yikablu ha'torah b'sinai Vikaimuha, right? That this is the principal element and the reason why they were rescued and they went forth out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, so that they would accept the Torah at Sinai and fulfill it, right? So we see here that a big part of this counting is about connecting um, Yitziat Mitzrayim with Matan Torah, connecting our freedom with our our. Um, with our moral and spiritual mission in the world. And here we emulate the divine as well, that we are counting yesh me'ayin. We are counting um, the, from going from nothing to something, from a bottom spiritual state of slavery where we're deprived, deprived of our culture, of our ethics, of our connection to God and to our religious lives and cultural lives, um, towards matan Torah, towards Torah, where we can um, embrace our mission in the world and ultimately towards Eretz Yisrael, towards the land of Israel, where we can actualize that, that, that mission. 
And here we can talk about this as a ladder of climbing 49 spiritual steps in a ladder. We'll come back to this point of climbing towards uh, Shavuot, that we can embrace this in such a way and that we count upwards because we're looking forward. We're looking towards progress, inner progress, external progress. And so we don't just count downwards, we count upwards. Here, another explaining can come from the Rambam in the Mor Nevuchim. The Rambam has three primary works. He has his commentary on the Mishnah. Then he has his uh, Mishnah Torah, his book of laws. And then the Mor Nevuchim, the guide for the perplexed, his philosophical work. And he says over here in 343, uh, section 3, uh, chapter 43, that we count upwards like someone who is waiting for a loved one to arrive who counts the days by the hours. We count the days and we count the weeks of what we're counting, and we're counting up uh, yearning for this connection. Now, um, here we can talk a little bit about a perspective on time um, that Stephen Hawking, as as mentioned here, um, who passed away just yesterday, um, said the increase of disorder or entropy is what distinguishes the past from the future giving a direction to time. This is a common theory among scientists today that rather than moving towards greater order um, and interconnectivity, we're actually in many ways moving uh, through that interconnectivity towards era of chaos um, and towards disorder. And this is an interesting way to think of religious life, that moving from the disorder of Pesach to the order of Torah could be one perspective. But the other could be that we're actually moving from simplicity to complexity. One of the blessings of freedom is that we are able to hold on to complexity and uh, moving towards the disorder that once we become a, once we're slaves, we're all uniform. We're all the same. We're dressed the same. We sleep together. We're, we're all, we, we, we look alike. You know, there's no, there's no differentiation in our language or in our learning. But once we move towards sovereignty, when you become a state of self-determination in Eretz Yisrael with the Torah, then we have, um, we move from unification, even though there's an achdut, to diversification, to difference of dialect, of race, of ideas, of intellectual explosion, of interpretations of ideas, and towards a, a plurality of our, of our identity towards, to some degree, a disorder. This is what we see in Medinat Israel today, the state of Israel, is what does it mean to be a Jew? Who is a Jew? What does it mean to build a Jewish state? The complexities, the disorder of it. Now, some people view that as a, as a, a downside to the state. Where is the unity, right? And there, 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 there is a case to make about unity. But there's also this point that here in Israel, um, we have uh, diversity and we have machlokit, we have disagreement. And that's a beautiful thing that when that can be sustained and nurtured in healthy ways, it's a beautiful thing. So moving towards Har Sinai can be moved, thought of as moving towards order, or it can be thought of, as Stephen Hawking says here, moving towards disorder, in a sense. And so, um, um, uh, uh, so too we can think of religion that way. Many people view religion as a refuge in a world of chaos, um, that it gives order and structure to a chaotic existence, and many find that very appealing. And many others find religion to be a refuge from simplicity of everyday existence. Those who love to study Talmud don't do that for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of order. If you want order, you just study the Shulchan Aruch. It'll just tell you what to do. You study the Talmud, you're going to hold on to a lot of disagreement, a lot of complexity, a lot of disorder even. Even uh, result, even uh, even debates that end in teku, that essentially don't get resolved. So the Rambam says here, we're counting upwards. And one idea of counting upwards can be that we're looking towards progress, either in a state of order or a state of chaos where we continue to coexist. Now, Rabbi Arya Carmel writes over here that the Omer on Pesach was from the barley harvest and the offering on Shavuot was of wheat, of wheat as opposed to barley. Barley is mainly food for animals, he explains. Wheat is food for human beings. The Torah hints to us that physical independence by itself still leaves people from the Torah perspective on the animal level, right? Now, today we can challenge the, 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 the strict binary of animal and human. We know that humans are a form of animal biologically and according to situational ethics 
and according to uh, 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 the way we, we interact and engage, humans are in many ways just as predictable as animals. But in theory, at least, and, um, and in many cases in actualization, humans have this gift of free will, um, of being able to uh, exit the rat race. Um, and make make free choices. And the Tanya explains that we have this constant choice between the animal side of ourself and the angelic side of ourself to choose our, listen to our lower angels, if you will, Abraham Lincoln, or, or our higher angels, um, and to make that choice each day. And he says, moving from the barley Omer to um, the wheat of Shavuot, moving from there is actualizing the human condition which we have been gifted, actualizing our unique human potential to uh, live with freedom. Again, not an empty freedom that is just uh, doing whatever I please when I, as I please, but a freedom which is rooted in responsibility towards others and towards the other. Now, the Omer, of course, um, and by the way, feel free to weigh in here with comments or questions on this or anything related, as I, I'll continue to monitor. The Omer is also traditionally a time of mourning. We don't do weddings during these uh, first 33 days of the Omer. Some go even longer um, for the whole Omer. Um, and uh, we refrain from certain joyous activities. And we learn this in the Bavli, Yavamot 62b, in the Talmudic tractate of Yavamot 62b, where it says, they said that Rabbi Akiva had 12,000 pairs of students, meaning 24,000 students, from Givat to Antiprat, and they all died one period of time because they did not treat each other with respect. It says here, going down lower, between Pesach and Atzeret, between Pesach and Shavuot, these 24,000 students died, and then it says in Bereshit Rabbah, Chapter 61, section 3, Rabbi Akiva said to his new students after the death, after the dying had stopped, my sons, the first ones only died because they did not look generously toward one another. Pay attention that you do not act like them. And we learn here that what can happen, and we see this in the Jewish people today, is a lot of divisions, a lot of divisions among us, which are very tragic um, because they don't highlight uh, respectful disagreement, but um, really a lot of disrespect. And we see historically that that led to the downfall of the Jewish people. In fact, in the 20th century, there were two great uniters, uniting factors of the Jewish people. The Holocaust and the state of Israel, the Shoah was our, our shared history. We all were affected, or almost all of us were affected um, by this, uh, this horrible atrocity uh, beyond belief. And we commemorated and remembered together. And the state of Israel, um, the founding of the state of Israel was a great uniter of, of Achtut, of the unity of the Jewish people. Sadly today, these two issues are perhaps the two greatest, um, the, the most divisive of, of, of any issues. We're not so divided by denominations, our belief of God or our belief of Torah. People don't debate that so much anymore, right? That was the last century. But today, the big point of disagreement, is the Holocaust used for my liberal agenda? Is it used for my conservative agenda? Used for my conservative agenda, I should be hawkish, never again. Used for my liberal agenda, I should be universalistic. We should protect all peoples, right? Great disagreement on how to talk about the Holocaust. Should Yom HaShoah be about commemorating the Jews who were killed, or should it be about addressing genocides today? So too, the state of Israel was the great uniter, and today, um, not just the far left and the far right, even the left and the right, Democrats and Republicans, and even beyond partisanship, um, the debates around Israel um, are tearing the Jewish community apart um, by the rhetoric that is used to talk about Zionists from the left, or, or far-right Zionists, and those that are talked about liberal Zionists, or those who aren't Zionists from the right, in ways that um, are causing irreparable da damage to the Jewish people today. Um, that those who merely place their, their, um, their politics around Israel as primary, they can engage in such rhetoric, because they don't care about the future of the Jewish people. But those who care about the survival of the Jewish people know that responsible rhetoric has to be used in talking about our disagreements, about how to understand the Holocaust and Israel in our, in our debates today. Okay, so that is about um, the mourning period of the Omer. And then we get to Lagba Omer, 
Lag Ba'omer, the 33rd day, actually my wedding day, uh, one of the happiest day of my life, Lag Ba'omer, when the killing stopped, but even more, that this is connected to the Rashbi, to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it says, uh, the greatest scholar of, uh, of, uh, of Jewish mysticism, historically, died on that day, is the tradition. And um, he was hiding from the Romans in the cave for, for uh, 13 years, learning Torah with his son. You can read the story on Shabbat 33b in the Talmud. And um, that on this day of Lag Ba'omer, the tradition says, he revealed the hidden secrets of the depths of the Kabbalah. And so the tradition is that this is the origins of, of the Zohar. We know the Zohar, as we have it written today, according to uh, virtually all scholarly positions, uh, comes, you know, uh, comes a millennia later. Um, you know, hundreds, hundreds of years, almost a thousand years later, uh, is it written down. But according to, uh, to tradition, the origins of those ideas come from the Rashbi. And it says in the Zohar on Lag Ba'omer, we should, you know, we should have a bonfire, we should have a party. And it says, come and gather every year for the Hilula, the anniversary of the Rashbi. Uh, the Chatam Sofer says in his response on Yuradeya 233, further, that historically, this is when in the, in the Midbar, in the desert, that the food from Egypt ran out and the, the, the mana, the man, began to fall. And so we also commemorate this day uh, um, as the, the end of our morning stage to celebrate historically that now the, uh, um, that the Jewish people were cared for in a new way with the mana, since their food ran out. Okay, our last two sources, and then we're going to move to the theory of time before we wrap up. <coughs> Again, feel free to weigh in with any comments or questions here you may have. The Baal Hatanya said in Lakute Torah in Bamidbar that the way we count is connected to various Kabbalistic midot, um, the seven midot, uh, character traits of the upper world of Atzilut. I will post this source so you can read it, anyone who wants to see it in size. And it says the 50th gate, moving from Tuma to Tahara, moving from impurity to purity, the 50th gate and the 50 days of counting is the upper gate, which includes all the aspects and everything in this is contained within the 49 aspects, which are united to a single unity. We see here that spiritually, we want to use these days as a climbing period, climbing a ladder each day, that there's nothing more dangerous Jewishly than remaining spiritually stagnant and intellectually stale. Just keep doing what we were doing, keep saying the ideas over and over, keep engaging in the same practices with the same intentions, um, will eventually lead to burnout or just pure disengagement. Um, and so uh, we need creativity, we need renewal, and these 49 days, our experiments, our, th our thought experiments and spiritual practices towards <coughs> maintaining our excitement and connection and our growth. And then lastly, <clears throat> if we look at Pirkei Avot, chapter six, um, excuse me, section, uh, yeah, chapter six, Mishnah six, 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 where we learn of the 48 ways that Torah is acquired. And those 48 day ways uh, can be connected to the 48 days of counting. And then interesting, I saw a, uh, a, a Hasidic teaching that the 49th way is through silence, right? There's these 48 ways that we can acquire Torah and the 49th is through silence, okay? So I think that the main point we want to take away here is not just that there was historically this Omer offering um, that moves us from Pesach to Shavuot, but then there's this counting period that moves us from freedom towards mandate, uh, liberation towards mission, and that our work today is the midot work, the character work each day, to pick a new midah, a new trait. Today I'm going to work on courage. Today I'm going to work on humility. Today I'm going to work on restraining my anger. I'm going to work on patience, right? And f create this list and figure out ways we're not just going to learn about the midah or talk about it, um, but actually write about it and practice it so that we can become the kind of people we wish to be in the world. Now, what does this mean about a theory of time? A theory of time. First, we can talk about the nature of light. There's a big debate about the nature of light as to whether light is a continuous wave or whether light is a uh, disorganized uh, series of particles. And according to some, it's both. 
right, that is time connected or disconnected, right? In post-modernity, post-modern thought, we often talk about um, the breaking of the grand meta-narratives, that in fact the past is not connected to the present or the future in any linear kind of way um, that makes sense. We merely show these connections to put order in our lives of, of, uh, of um, uh, cause and effect, um, of continuity as a people, continuity as ideas, um, where in fact very much has, much has changed in fact. So one theory of time, of course, is cyclical that essentially there's nothing new. We just kind of continue to repeat the same cycles. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, history continues to repeat itself, as many, as many say. Um, and there's another theory that, in fact, everything is new um, and nothing is connected. And it's an oversimplification to say that this moment is anything like a past moment. Um, or, in fact, that we as a Jewish people, the 21st century in America, are anything like the Jewish people of 18th century Morocco or 3rd century Babylonia or, or, um, or of the Israelites who left Egypt, right? Some say we are the same, we are interconnected, it is the same people, it's the same, the same moments. Um, some say everything is new, everything is different. So one approach could be the, teleolo- the teleological approach to time, which essentially says that time is about purpose, right? We are mission-driven. We are destination-driven. The Sphira to Omer is about getting somewhere, getting to Shavuot, right? But the other approach around Sphira to Omer uh, is a different theory of time, which is a spiritual approach to time. We're not trying to go anywhere. We're not trying to get anywhere. Rather, this is about radical presence, about being here, being here now. That we're not merely counting to, to connect Pesach to Shavuot, but we're counting to embrace the power of today. To embrace the power of today. Again, to return to Stephen Hawking, who said, uh, who passed away yesterday, um, and we can bracket his various political uh, views on this and that, but his intellectual views, which were widely acclaimed as uh, some of the most brilliant of, of our era, he says the increase of disorder or entropy is what distinguishes the past from the future, giving a direction of time. That actually we are moving towards chaos and we are moving towards disorder. And I think one of the ways we can embrace the Sfirata Omer as we are climbing our spiritual steps towards greater ethical and moral uh, clarity and new heights as we work towards progress within ourselves and within the world, that we are moving towards an order that exists within a state of disorder, that we are moving towards um, um, a sense of clarity within a sense of chaos. And so I give us all the bracha, I give us all the blessing as we approach Pesach, uh, approach Passover very very soon, um, and approach this, the counting of the Omer towards Shavuot, that we prepare ourselves for a curriculum where we can not only fulfill the mitzvah of counting, uh, mitzvah 306, based upon, or connected to mitzvah 302 around the, the Omer offering, um, but also in addition to this, this, this particular mitzvah of connecting the holidays, that we can also uh, ensure our own growth to actualize our own unique potential in the world. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day.